Good morning, River City Church. I'm glad you could be with us this morning as we celebrate what Christ has done for us and worshiping together. Just want to encourage you as you join us this morning to uh, worship, sing aloud, and let's together um, celebrate what Christ has done for us. Jesus. 
Jesus, I hope I redemption. Your presence is here. Your presence is here. And I will trust in you. Amen. Glad you could join with us and sing and worship this morning. Especially in times like these, uh, we can all use a little bit of encouragement. And so this morning, I want us to look at the Apostle Paul's words to the church in Philippi in Macedonia. We're specifically focusing on chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And encouragement can come from some pretty different places. Paul was actually in prison when he sent this letter of encouragement to the church. So this morning, as we look at this, I just want us to pray, ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to receive through God's Word what He has for us this morning. So in the letter of Philippians, Paul is writing a letter to the church in Philippi, which was located in Macedonia. It was a church that he himself had helped start with, along with some other people. And they had sent some gifts. He's in a Roman prison at this time. And in those times, if you didn't have someone bring you food, you didn't eat in those prisons. So that church took an offering. They sent some people to love and to care for Paul. And as those people are visiting him, he hears that the church is struggling. They're discouraged. Um, they're, They're facing persecution from the society and the community around them. Philippi was an important city. It was home to a lot of Roman soldiers. And as a result, uh, nationalism and and patriotism was a big part of that city. So this new message of a new king who was king over all was not very popular. The Christian's new way of living in peace was contrary to the Romans' way of war and and conquering. So as a result, a lot of Christians uh, at that time, their businesses were being threatened. uh, They were personally being threatened. And life was difficult, and there was a lot of fear and anxiety in the church. And so Paul writes to them to encourage them to help them refocus on what they truly have in Christ. So in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 through 9, I want to focus on this section. I encourage you to uh, read through uh, the book of Philippians yourself. It's a shorter book in the Bible. But I want us to particularly focus on these words of encouragement. It's very practical advice, uh, spiritual wisdom even, that Paul is giving the church and through God's word is giving to us today. Starting in verse 1. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you. Dear friends, you are my joy and the crown I receive from my work. Obviously, we can relate with being distant and not being able to see and be with the people that you want to be with. That was the case for Paul. But he's also reminding them that that he has this joy, and this joy is not based upon his situation. They know he's writing from prison. 
His joy is in the gifts and the blessings that he has received through the body of Christ, through, through God's kingdom, that they themselves, the church, give him joy. Going on in verse 2. Now I appeal to Euodia and Sittichi, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Paul is reminding them that they belong to Jesus and not to themselves. That whatever discouragement, whatever divisions are taking place right now because of the stress and the anxiety that they're under, that it's not worth it. They need to put that aside and, and make every effort to come together. The two ladies mentioned worked with Paul to help establish this church. And under the anxiety and, and the fears and whatever personal issues were happening, they were allowing these superficial, temporary things to begin to erode and divide and to hinder the eternal work that they were still called to do and be a part of. So Paul reminds them of this. He reminds them of, of, of their mission, their goal, how important they are to him, to each other in this. And, and he asks for mediation, for them to take up what Christ has called them to be, to be peacemakers and to make peace. We see in our own society, it's so easy for even Christians, if you look on social media, or arguing and fighting with one another over this and over that and this conspiracy and that conspiracy and arguing with their neighbors and their leaders. We are called to be peacemakers. We are called to encourage one another. And it's so easy in our society to feel like we have to pick sides. And Paul's encouraging them that you know these people, you know their value, you know uh, what God has called them to. Let's encourage one another towards the things that God is calling us to, not pick sides and try to fight and hinder what God is doing. We need to be careful not to get caught up in temporal and foolish arguments. Things that don't matter aren't going to last, especially when eternity is on the line. It's very easy to get caught up in everything going around. The world says, pick a side, label yourself this, label yourself that, and prove you're right. But Paul's reminding the church right here to, to not be worrying about picking a side that they're called to be peacemakers. How can we be peacemakers and encourage peace in the world around us if even within the body of Christ, we're arguing and fighting amongst ourselves? So verse 4, right after Paul is addressing these issues, he says this, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. He's really wanting to emphasize this. He's saying it twice. Let everyone see you are considerate in all you do. And remember the Lord is coming soon. I love it. Paul says this. He says, always. It's kind of a, imagine they're sitting there in their circumstance thinking, always, Paul, you, I've always got to be full of the joy that God has given me. Now, if anyone had a right to say it, it was Paul. He was sitting in prison. But he says always, and he says it, he emphasizes it twice. He says, not only always be full of the joy of the Lord, but rejoice, be full of this joy, the celebratory joy in your life at all times and in all situations. The reality is that always isn't possible. It's not possible if what we are taking joy from is temporary, is, is part of this world. What Paul is saying is that if your joy is, is dependent upon your comfort, it's dependent upon your status in society, how your neighbors view you, if your joy is, is built on temporary pleasures of this world, you will be out of joy. But because of what we have in Christ, we can always have joy. We can always have something to celebrate in every season, in every circumstance of our life. Verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Verse 7, it's then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. What we see here, and Paul, I, I love the language. He's saying, always be full of joy. He makes this crazy statement that, that don't worry about anything. That we are to pray about everything. And that we are to tell God what we need and, and thank Him 
for all that he's done. And it's then, it's after we've done these things, then we will experience God's peace, a peace that doesn't make sense given what's going on around us. See, peace follows contentment. We see that contentment comes from refocusing our eyes on what truly matters and allowing ourselves to be thankful for what we do have. And in Christ, we have everything that we need. If we are not intentional to to fill our lives with thankfulness for what we do have, that space instead will, will eventually unintentionally become full of resentment and fear. Peace and contentment are not about getting what we want. They are about seeing and recognizing that that God is faithful and He has already given us all that we need. When we remember and celebrate God's faithfulness, we will remember to turn to Him first and not the things of this world. And I think that was one of the things that Paul was getting at. The church in Philippi was losing sight of. They were looking at what they didn't have. They were looking at their position. And they were forgetting that everything they had... Everything that, that they were willing to risk everything for initially, they still had. It could never be taken away from them. Paul's reminding them, and I believe reminding us, the importance of celebrating God's faithfulness. When we look and focus on what He has done for us, and we remember that, and we celebrate it and become thankful for that, it reminds us that God is faithful and that He will provide what we need And it's then that we can experience the peace and joy of God's promised presence in the midst of any circumstance or situation. Paul doesn't want the church in Philippi to forget or miss out on what God has done for them. That peace and that joy that goes beyond any understanding It's really a result of of the restorative power of the kingdom of God within us. The peace and that joy that comes from from existing in Christ, refocusing on Him and what He's done for us. That peace and that joy that floods into our situations in our lives that, that doesn't make sense that we should have it in such circumstances. It's that peace and that joy that is a result of the restorative power of the kingdom of God within us. It's the kingdom of God, the power of God, defying the situations and circumstances of the world around us. Going on to verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. And if anyone has the right to to say this, say, hey, put into practice what I have taught you. Paul's sitting in a Roman prison, doesn't have a penny to his name, and he's sitting there full of joy and hope. He may be executed. And Paul's response, as we see in other parts of this text, is, If I die, it's my gain. He hopes not to because he knows other people need to hear the good news of Jesus. And for that reason, and that reason alone, he's willing to stay in this life and suffer so that others might find that eternal joy and that peace that he has even now while suffering in a prison. So Paul's giving us some very practical advice to put our focus, our minds, our eyes on Christ And look at what is good. Not be focused on the bad and and circumstances, but look at what is good. Look at what God is doing, even in the midst of what is around us. And I love that he's saying we need to set our minds on what is good. And sometimes it's hard to, to see what is good in the midst of things. But when we don't think that there's anything good left around us to dwell on or to think on, I want to encourage us, it's in that moment that we simply need to to put our eyes on Jesus. To fix our eyes on Him, to stare at the goodness and love of God. And it's then that our eyes will be open to the beauty that is still all around us. God is still at work. There's still beautiful things taking place. 
in our lives in and through every circumstance. But if we don't have our eyes fixed on God, if we only have our eyes fixed on circumstances, we're going to miss those blessings. We're going to miss the beauty. We're going to miss those glimmers of God's kingdom shining through the darkness in our situations and in our lives. So I want us to take Paul's very practical advice and kind of take inventory and and look around in our lives and look at Jesus and say, what do we have to be thankful for? I mean, if God never did another miracle for me, the reality is that what he did for me on the cross, that his love for me, his presence that I can stand and be in, is worth more than anything else I could possibly experience or desire in this world. But he does give us more. He does bless us with the things that we need. And so I want to encourage us to take inventory, to look, look into our lives, look around us, Look at our family, look at our friends, look at the body of Christ, look at God's word, and what are the things that we have in our lives that we are taking for granted? I want to encourage and challenge us to stop keeping track and keeping a list of all the things that are wrong and all the people that are wrong and trying to fix them. And let's look and focus and take inventory and count and be thankful for the good things that God has given us and is doing for us even now. When we as Christians find ourselves without joy. It's not because God has left us or abandoned us. It's not because we have a lack of things to be joyful and and it's not because we have a lack of, of God's presence to bring peace into our lives. It's because we ourselves have have failed to simply put into practice looking to him. I know in my own life when I feel worn out and tired and when that fear and anxiety or resentment for life and the way things are creeps in, it's at those moments our eyes are fixed on what we don't have. Our eyes are fixed on what we think we want and need rather than on God's faithfulness and staring and looking and thanking and celebrating Him for the blessings and the privileges that we do have. So I know for my own self, when I start to resent my situations, start to feel bitter or start to feel angry at God and other people, it's because I need to get my eyes off the things that worry, disappoint, and frustrate me. I need to pick my head up and and look to Jesus, look to him and look to the work and the blessings that he has already done for me. See, when we focus and we look at the things that he's already done for us, we realize that he is faithful. And as we begin to celebrate those things that he already has done, celebrate who he is and celebrate that he is with us now, it's in that moment that we can even begin to celebrate and be excited for the things that we don't even know are yet to come. It's in this moment that God's peace and his joy floods in. So as Paul was encouraging the church in Philippi, I want us to be encouraged, our church, here this morning, that though we may be apart, that we have love and appreciation for one another, that we not only celebrate what God has done in our own lives, but as Paul encouraged, may we stand up and encourage one another. May we move each other uh, eyes and gaze towards Christ and and the things that he has done for us. May we bring peace and bring joy into this world. May we usher in God's kingdom and may we put into practice the spiritual wisdom of just being thankful for who God is and what he's done for us and for one another.
pray. Father, I just thank you that you have given us more than enough reason to always be full of joy, to always dwell within your peace in the midst of any storm, of any circumstance. Though we may not be happy with our circumstances or things around us, we can still take joy and peace in you. So, Father, I pray that you just lift our eyes to you. You lift our eyes to the blessings, the countless blessings that we have. And may our hearts be filled with joy and wonder and celebration for you, for each other, and for your kingdom. And I pray that your kingdom would continue to expand throughout this time. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. So as Paul was thanking the church in Philippi for their faithfulness and their their generosity and helping care for his needs, uh, I also just want to thank uh, our church and our friends and family of River City Church for being faithful and generous and supporting the work of River City Church and and our missionaries and sharing the good news and the gospel of Christ uh, to the ends of the earth. If you've never had an opportunity to give before, um, I encourage you to just listen, let God lead you. If you're feeling led to give and to partner and, and walk in obedience to God's word to uh, give to the work of the gospel, then I encourage you, you can do that in a couple different ways. You can simply give by uh, putting in and following the link uh, below the, the bottom of the screen. You can also text and the number above, download the app and give that way as well. So I want to thank you all for your faithfulness and your faithfulness to one another to not only contribute uh, to the work, but also to invest our time in, in each other. So I encourage you to continue to do that. Call one another, message one another. If you're praying and God puts uh, someone on your heart and mind, call them, encourage them. Uh, like Paul encourage the church to do with those two ladies. Let us be peacemakers, let us be encouragers, and let us share the encouragement and the hope that God has given us with each other and to those around us. So go in God's peace and God's blessings upon you. May we see each other soon.